And this morning, our speaker, Jeffrey Stone, is the Edward H. Levy Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago. Mr. Stone was educated at the University of Pennsylvania and University of Chicago Law School, where he served as editor-in-chief of the Law Review. After serving as law clerk to Justice William, Jr., William J. Brennan, Jr. of the Supreme Court of the United States, Mr. Stone joined the faculty of the University of Chicago Law School. He also served as dean of the law school and as provost of the University of Chicago. Mr. Stone is the author or co-author of many books on constitutional law, including Speaking Out, Reflections of Law, Liberty, and Justice in 2010, Top Secret, When Our Government Keeps Us in the Dark, 2007, We're in Liberty and um, An American Dilemma, Perilous Times, Free Speech and Wartime, and Eternally Vigilant, Free Speech in the Modern Era. Perilous Times received eight National Book Awards. Mr. Stone edits the Supreme Court Review and served as a chair of the board of the American Constitutional Society, Constitution Society, pardon me. And that's just a, a very brief list of his many accomplishments and leadership roles. And uh, Jeffrey Stone's next major work is called Sexing the Constitution. And it will explore the history of sex from ancient Greece to contemporary constitutional law. Should be <laughs> a great read. <laughs> And today he will speak on the Roberts Court and the Constitution. Professor Stone, welcome. Thank you, Svetlana. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I should tell you at the outset that um, I have a terrible head cold, and so uh, I ask you to bear with me. Uh, it's very difficult to speak uh, or to teach when you have a uh, cold like this because it's all fuzzy and you can't keep your thoughts straight and and so it's a challenge to stay focused and and uh, so I appreciate your forbearance. Um, whenever I, I feel this way, I, I, I remember when I was a kid growing up in New York and I had a friend, one of my, one of the group of kids I hung out with named Eddie Dubler and Eddie was slower than the rest of us. Nothing clinical but just obviously a little bit slower on the uptake and I used to wonder what it was like to go through life as, as Eddie. And, and one day I had this cold, like the one I have at the moment, and I, um, I remember thinking, um, this is what it must be like to go through life as Eddie Dubler. <laughs> and then about 20 years later, um, as Fidlana said, I was a law clerk to Justice Brennan on the Supreme Court. Um, I was having lunch one day with the justice, and he had this terrible cold, and he was coughing and sneezing, and I was feeling sorry for him. And it occurred to me that uh, he must be sitting there thinking, oh, this is what it must be like to go through life as Jeff Stone. <laughs> so what goes around comes around. So what I want to talk about today is constitutional interpretation and the Roberts Court. And um, I know that most of you are not lawyers, so I will try to be clear and not use too much uh, unexplained jargon. Uh, and let me begin by saying that in, in defining the appropriate stance towards interpreting the Constitution, a fundamental question is how much deference or how much aggressiveness a court should use in applying and interpreting provisions of the Constitution in the face of decisions by the democratically elect elected branches of government that are being questioned. So, for example, the First Amendment to the Constitution provides that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. What does that mean? Right? Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes gave the famous example of a false cry of fire in a crowded theater to prove that it didn't mean what it said. Obviously, the government can punish someone who falsely cries fire in a crowded theater, causing a mad dash to the exits, and the trampling of individuals. So the question then is, well, what then does it mean to say Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech? It can't mean what it literally seems to mean. Someone's got to give content to that. Or the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause provides that no state shall deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. So what does that mean? You can drive if you don't have a driver's license? 
You can practice law if you've never gone to law school. It's unequal to treat people differently. Again, the court's got to figure out what it means to deny people equal protection of the laws. It can't mean everyone gets treated the same all the time. So the challenge in making sense of these open-ended provisions of the Constitution, which are most of the provisions that are of interest, um, is to figure out how passive or how active a court should be in interpreting and applying those provisions in the face of a claim by the elected branches of government, what we're doing is constitutional. Right? So do you bend over backwards and say, okay, it's plausible that what the government's doing is consistent with the First Amendment or is consistent with the Equal Protection Clause, so we give them the benefit of the doubt. Or do you say, no, we, we can't give you the benefit of the doubt. We think you have violated equal protection, or we think you have violated freedom of speech, and it's going to be unconstitutional even though you disagree with us. So that's a central question. How do you know how much deference or how much activism to employ? So historically, there are two models. Simplistically, there's judicial restraint, which basically says give the benefit of the doubt to the elected branches of government and don't hold anything unconstitutional unless it's clearly, unequivocally, unambiguously unconstitutional. Otherwise, the government gets to do what it wants to do. The other approach is judicial activism, under which courts basically say, no, we get to interpret the Constitution. We decide what those terms mean. And we impose upon you, the elected branches of government, a very high burden of justifying what we think would be a violation of the Constitution. Okay, now, one mistaken understanding that is commonplace needs to be addressed at the outset. That is, it is conventional wisdom that judicial activism is liberal and judicial restraint is conservative. And I want to make clear that's completely erroneous. Indeed, the first era, era of judicial activism in our judicial history was in the early years of the 20th century when a very conservative group of justices held unconstitutional a broad range of progressive legislation requiring um, a, a, a minimum wage legislation, maximum hours of work, uh, child labor, uh, women labor, and so on, regulating all those things. And this very conservative group of justices took an extremely activist approach to the Constitution and held all this progressive legislation unconstitutional. Moreover, in recent days, the Supreme Court conservative justices will argue that affirmative action is unconstitutional or laws regulating guns are unconstitutional, or laws regulating campaign finance are unconstitutional, or in the case of four of the justices, um, the Affordable Care Act is unconstitutional. Those are examples of judicial activism, even though they happen to be conservative positions. So the first thing to get clear is judicial activism and judicial restraint are methodologies, but they can be used equally and have been used equally over time by both people who are politically conservative and people who are politically liberal. Right? And it's only the product of essentially conservative public relations that has given the impression to the American people that activism is liberal and bad and restraint is conservative and good. That's totally a fallacy. Okay, second point is what do you do about this? Right? What is the right stance in this context? So the modern history of this debate really begins with the Warren Court. So the Warren Court, which consisted of justices who were of a liberal bent, tended to be pretty activist in their understanding and interpretation of the Constitution. They invalidated laws that restricted what they saw as freedom of speech, what they saw as race discrimination, uh, what they saw as unfairness to individuals accused of crime, um, to uh, individuals in, in the process in which they dealt with government in terms of their benefits being taken away, um, in terms of the right to vote. 
they, in, the, in a broad range of areas, the Warren Court justices did not give much deference to the elected branches of the government in those realms. And conservatives attacked the Warren Court for being judicially activist. They said the right approach for the court was to be restrained. And that the Warren Court did was to run amok by substituting the justice's personal political policy preferences for the real meaning of the Constitution and thereby compelled the rest of the nation to live by their own policy judgments. So it was in that era that the notion that judicial activism is liberal first came into full being. So what's the alternative to judicial activism? When Richard Nixon ran for president in 1968, he ran in part on an attack on the Warren Court, which continued until 1969. And on the ground that the court had essentially acted irresponsibly, politically, and unjustifiably in substituting the values of the justices for the true values of the Constitution. And the right approach Nixon argued, was judicial restraint. That was his argument. So judicial restraint meant, as I said earlier, essentially that the proper role for justices is simply to sit back and allow the elected branches of government, state legislatures, federal Congress, and so on, to do pretty much what they wanted, unless you could say beyond a reasonable doubt, unquestionably, the law is unconstitutional, given some clear objective meaning. But basically, deference to the other branches of government. And in fact, when Nixon appointed four justices to the court in the first two years of his term, Berger, Blackman, Powell, and Rehnquist, he appointed four justices who were conservative in that sense. That is, they were in fact justices who were much more inclined to take a restrained view of the authority of the Supreme Court and of the courts generally. So their view of conservative was judicial restraint. That's what a conservative meant in that period. Now, there are clear problems with judicial restraint as a mode of constitutional interpretation. The most obvious problem is that it abdicates the constitutional responsibility of judges. When the Constitution was created, the framers of the Constitution were very concerned about abuse of majoritarian power. They were very concerned about circumstances where majorities, who generally would make the decisions in, in our democracy, might make those decisions really badly. And they knew, human nature being what it is, that there are circumstances where majorities will act out of intolerance, out of prejudice, out of fear, out of panic, um, and that's bad. And the question was how to, how to guard against that danger of democracy. And one of the ways they did that is, of course, by separation of powers, right, by dividing power between the House and the Senate and the President, and having the House members elected for two years, and the Senate members elected for six years, and the President elected for four years, all of which was designed to try to prevent any moment's majority from being able to dominate the process. But even so, they were concerned. And so one question that arose at the time the Constitution was adopted was whether to put specific concrete limitations on what majorities can do, that is, the Bill of Rights. Now, in the original Constitutional Convention in 1787, the framers decided not to include a Bill of Rights in the Constitution. They decided that for several reasons, but one of the most important ones was their view that it would serve no purpose. That ultimately, even if you listed a bunch of rights, that the majority would just disregard it. They would just do what they wanted to do anyway, and they would say they were acting in accord with whatever the Bill of Rights meant. And it would serve no purpose, but listing the rights might then bring the government into disrepute in ways that wouldn't be healthy. Also, they, they basically said that you don't need a Bill of Rights. Some of their framers said you don't need a Bill of Rights. A Bill of Rights is critical when you have a monarch, when you have a king. And these are rights of the people against the king. But once you have a democracy, there is no king. 
You, so why do you need a Bill of Rights? To protect us against whom? To protect us against us? And the answer to that, of course, was yes. We don't trust us. <laughs> right? So, but, the, but, the, the, but the primary reason was this notion of it would be pointless. Right? After the, the Constitution was presented for ratification, uh, many people objected to the absence of the Bill of Rights. And the, the debate then ensued about, well, should we put a Bill of Rights in the Constitution as a set of amendments? And if so, uh, would they have any real effect? And there's a wonderful exchange between James Madison, who was the, the, the primary draftman of, of the Constitution and, and of the Bill of Rights, and Thomas Jefferson, who was then serving as an ambassador to France. <clears throat> and when Jefferson saw the draft of the original Constitution, he wrote Madison and says, love it, it's cool, but where's the Bill of Rights? What are you guys thinking? And Madison wrote back and said, well, you know, we thought about this, and, but the truth is we thought these would just be um, parchment barriers, were his words, parchment barriers, that would be overridden by the whim of the majority and it would serve no purpose. And Jefferson wrote back and said, what about courts? Right? Independent tribunals of justice, right? appointed with life tenure, responsible to upholding the guarantees of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, right, can serve, <coughs> excuse me, can serve as an effective check on majorities. And Madison was persuaded by this, and, and when he eventually presented the Bill of Rights to the, to the first Congress, uh, the, the argument was made that, that it is these courts, these judges, who will be held to account for the function of enforcing these guarantees against majorities. And that was the key argument that was made. And so right from the beginning, it was understood that we need courts to play an, a meaningful, engaged role in enforcing constitutional guarantees against majorities. So the problem with judicial restraint across the boards is that it abdicates that fundamental responsibility that courts are supposed to have and therefore would allow the democratically elected branches of government to do things that they shouldn't be able to do, that the framers didn't want them to do, that they expected the courts to stop them from doing, but the courts would be saying, we wash our hands of this, we're not going to do it, and that would be dysfunctional. That was the criticism of judicial restraint. So you have these two models. Judicial activism is attacked on the ground that it's just judges making it up as they go along. They pick and choose what they want. They impute their own personal preferences into the vague, open-ended provisions of the Constitution, make the law abridging freedom of speech, deny equal protection of the laws, and so on. They say that's what these things mean, but what they're really doing is just smuggling their own views into the Constitution. That's legitimate. On the other hand, you've got the restraint view, which is criticized for completely abdicating the responsibility of the courts. So, interestingly, it was conservatives who recognized the, the, the deficiency of a judicial restraint position across the boards. And it was in the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, that the theory of originalism came into being. And people like Robert Bork and Antonin Scalia and Attorney General Edwin Meese basically said, okay, Judicial activism, where the court can basically do what it wants, is no good. It's unprincipled. It's a problem. Judicial restraint across the boards is no good because it abdicates. Is there some way to enable the courts to give real content to the co Constitution without inviting them to simply do whatever they please? And so they said, okay, the right way for courts to find a middle ground is to put themselves in the shoes of the people who framed the particular constitutional provision at issue and to be willing to invalidate any law that the framers of that provision themselves expected and intended to be unconstitutional. So if you knew that the framers of the First Amendment expected criticism of the government cannot constitutionally be prohibited, then the First Amendment would mean that. But if you didn't know that the framers thought anything about entertainment or commercial advertising 
or sexual expression, um, then courts couldn't touch it. But if you did know they intended to prohibit the government from, from stifling criticism of the government itself, that's what it meant. And courts should basically put themselves in the shoes of the framers and do what you knew they wanted to, themselves to do. Or under the Equal Protection Clause, for example, um, you would say, well, the framers of the Equal Protection Clause, we know they wanted to prohibit discrimination against African Americans. The 14th Amendment was enacted after the Civil War. That was the key purpose of the Equal Protection Clause. Therefore, laws that discriminate against African Americans are unconstitutional. Nothing else violates the Equal Protection Clause. So that allows courts to give a meaningful uh, role to these provisions, but cabins that justices from going beyond that. So this is some logic to the idea of originalism. But there are also disadvantages to originalism, and there are two dramatic ones. The first one is that it's easy to say we should do only what we know the framers intended us to do. It's another thing to actually figure out what it was they intended us to do. Because when you actually go back and look at what the framers themselves intended, it turns out that they rarely said anything that tells you definitively what they meant. In terms of the First Amendment, for example, they'd never lived in a world of free speech where there was any kind of a constitutional guarantee of free speech. They had no idea what they meant by Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. They didn't tell you what they meant. They didn't know what they meant. It was a principle. Similarly, with the Equal Protection Clause, it's true that you can say the framers intended the clause to prohibit um, discrimination against African Americans, but they didn't draft it that way. Right? They didn't say, no one shall deny equal protection of the laws to African Americans. They said, no state shall deny any person equal protection of the laws. And if you go back and look, you can't really tell what they meant by it. You knew they didn't mean African Americans, but you can't tell what else they meant by it. So what happens in that situation? So historians, professional historians go back, and they look at the history, and generally they say, is, eh, you know, <laughs> there's evidence on one side, there's evidence on the other side. You know, it's not clear. And of course, judges are much less well-equipped than historians to make these judgments. So then if you look at what actually happens when justices purport to be engaged in originalist analysis, justices like Scalia and Thomas, who was the most uh, committed to the idea of originalism, what you find is this. They look to the history, and they don't find, in fact, anything very definitive. And what they wind up doing essentially is saying, look, the framers were reasonable people. I am a reasonable people. <laughs> this is what I would have meant. <laughs> so this is what the framers must have meant. And lo and behold, the framers mean whatever it is that those conservative justices happen to think the, the constitutional provision should mean. And indeed, if you go back and look at every decision, I shouldn't say that, there's one or two exceptions, at virtually every decision in which justices use or purport to use originalism, they reach the result you would have predicted they would reach based on your understanding of their own general jurisprudence and ideological values, knowing nothing about the history. Right? So the, the first problem with originalism is that there's not enough information there in most circumstances to answer any hard questions. And so even though in theory it's not a bad idea, or maybe it's not a bad idea, it just doesn't work in practice because the data aren't available. The second problem with originalism is that it's totally inconsistent with itself. So the idea of originalism is we should do what the framers wanted us to do and no more and no less. But the problem is the framers weren't originalists. Right? They were men of the Enlightenment. They were men of the Enlightenment. Right? They believe that knowledge grows over time, that understanding grows over time. They fully understand that they didn't have the answers to science, they didn't have the answers to economics, they didn't have the answers to human nature, and they didn't have the answers to what freedom of speech meant or what equal protection meant. These were things that, in their own view, were to be determined over time. These were principles, these were aspirations. They weren't carefully defined meanings, and they wouldn't have wanted them to be carefully defined meanings.
And so the, the fact is, if you actually do what originalists ask you to do, and try to figure out what the framers wanted you to do, what you would get is not originalism. Right? So originalism, although it was well-intentioned, the idea behind it was well-intentioned, it profoundly fails for both of those reasons. And indeed, the truth is, although a lot of fuss has been made about originalism, it hasn't really had much of a real impact on the law. But that still leaves us with the problem of what to do. Right? If restraint is no good across the boards, if open-ended judicial activism, do what you want, is no good, then, well, what are you supposed to do? So here the answer, I think, is to go back and say, why do we want judges to have the power to interpret and apply the Constitution? Why not just leave it to the elected branches of government? Right? And the answer, which I suggested earlier, which is unambiguously correct, was a distrust of the elected branches of government, a distrust of majority in certain circumstances. And the argument then would be that what judges, judges should do in deciding how deferential they should be to the elected branches versus how skeptical they should be about the elected branches is to ask to what extent the problem of distrust is implicated in any particular type of law. So, for example, um, compare two, two simple illustrations of a law under the Equal Protection Clause. One is a law that provides that um, African Americans uh, are insufficiently educated as a group to be able to vote. And so African Americans can't vote. And the other one says that um, people who are not licensed to make eyeglasses cannot make eyeglasses. Now, it's true that there are people not licensed to make eyeglasses, they can make eyeglasses. Some of them are perfectly capable of doing it, despite the fact that they haven't had the technically required training. And they say, it's not fair. I can do it. Even though most of us maybe can't, some of us can. You can't tell us we can't do it. And the same with African Americans. You might say, um, particularly going back now to the late 19th century, you might say, well, you know, they've been denied an education in our society. And most of them are not really capable of, of, of exercising an informed ballot, but some of them are. And you might say, well, you know, it's the same as, as, as people who weren't trained to make eyeglasses. They're not ready to do this yet. And we have to draw lines, and it's the same thing. But the difference is that in the optometrist licensed case, we have no reason to distrust the legislative judgment. Sure, it's a generalization, but there's no reason to believe that the legislature is, is acting out of anything other than rational, legitimate <laughs> public interest. In the race case, however, there's plenty of reason to believe that the government's acting out of intolerance and prejudice and bias and using this as a justification for what amounts to essentially an illegitimate exercise of, of preventing people from exercising their individual rights. So one could say it's appropriate for the government to, to say, we'll give deference in the eyeglass case. The government says they got a good justification for it. Fine, who are we to second guess it? In the, in the, in the disenfranchisement of African Americans case, you say, no, you can't do that. Or think of a law that says African Americans can't make eyeglasses. Right? Uh, same thing. You say, no, you can't do that. Right? So, or in the speech context, imagine a law that says you can't criticize the government. And the problem there is, well, government, we don't trust government, elected officials, to determine what their critics can say. Right? If you give them the power to do that, you know they're going to abuse it you know they're going to use that power to silence their critics so that it's to perpetuate their own power. You can't give deference there. On the other hand, if they pass a law that says um, no smoking ads um, are allowed in, uh, on children's television, um, you might say, well, there's no reason to be suspicious here of any fundamental dysfunction in the way the government's operating. So if the government can come up with a rational justification for that, which obviously they can, you let them do it. Okay, so what that basically says is the way to make this decision about judicial activism and judicial restraint is by figuring out when it makes sense to distrust. And as far back as 1938, in a very famous footnote, the Supreme Court came up with a theory for when that distrust exists. It identified essentially two situations. One is when the law is disadvantaging a minority 
or some other group that historically has not been adequately represented in the political process, has been subjected in the past to unfair disadvantage, and where there's therefore reason to believe that they're not going to get a fair shake systematically in the elected governing process. That's a case where distrust of the majority is, is present. And the second situation, they said, um, is where the government is essentially subject to the, the problem of capture. That is, one danger in a democratic society is any moment's majority will change the rules of the political process so as to ensure their own perpetuation in power. That's a fundamental danger of democracy. Right? So that's another situation of distrust. When government passes rules that regulate, in some general sense, the political process, you've got to be suspicious. And you don't be deferential there. You say, you better prove to us that what you're doing is really important or otherwise we're not going to let you play that game. Now, if you accept those as two good circumstances where distrust is appropriate, that explains the Warren Court. Every decision of the Warren Court that has been attacked as activist by its generally conservative critics fits into those two categories. They are completely about protecting African Americans, protecting political dissenters, religious minorities, uh, individuals accused of crime, on the one hand, that is those groups who are historically subject to disadvantage and need protection from the majoritarian process, which is generally unsympathetic to them, or they fall into those situations where the risk of capture is present. One person, one vote, uh, right to vote, freedom to criticize the government, um, and the like. So the entire war court enterprise really is just an application of the 1938 footnote in a case called Caroline Products, that says we will be activists in these two circumstances where the risk of government dysfunction is fairly high. And other than that, the Warren Court was generally quite restrained. So one can answer the attack on the Warren Court by saying, by arguing, that it was not just the justices picking and choosing what values or political preferences they liked. They were actually acting out of a coherent, Indeed, I would say fairly persuasive understanding of what is the fundamental role of the court in a democratic system. That is, it's to correct majoritarian dysfunction. Now, let's take a look at, at the conservative justices um, in recent years and see how they apply the power of constitutional interpretation. So they basically put forth two theories. One theory is originalism. And the other theory is judicial restraint. That is, as Chief Justice Roberts said in his confirmation hearings, I'm just an umpire. I just call balls and strikes. I'm neutral. You know, I just call them as I see them. Uh, there's no, no involvement of my personal predilections or, or otherwise. So t does, does the, the jurisprudence of the, of the conservative justices today um, in fact reflect that kind of approach? And the answer is emphatically no. So this court has been as activist as the Warren Court. That is, it has struck down as many laws, and it's higher the percentage of the laws in the cases that come before it, as the Warren Court did. But the question then is, okay, what are the cases in which they do that? So the best way to evaluate a court is not to sort of look at each case, case by case, and see what you think about it. It's to step back and to do what I did a moment ago with the Warren Court and say, let's just lay all the cases out there and see if we can figure out what was really going on in these opinions. What was really driving the court? Well, if one does that with the Roberts, with the Rehnquist and Roberts courts, let's say, what one discovers is that the court has been quite activist, but the cases in which it has been activist cannot be explained on any principled ground. That is, I have, I have had this conversation with many of my conservative friends, and I've said to them, okay, here's a list of the, war, of, of the Rehnquist and Roberts Court's opinions in which they have invalidated laws and upheld laws. Right? Explain to me in a principled way what's going on. And they never get back to me. Because <laughs> it can't be explained by judicial restraint because they're often very activist. And it can't be explained by originalism because they, they, they play with originalism on occasional cases, but very rarely. So then one has to say, what, what's happening here? So here are the areas in which the, the, the Roberts Court has been 
activists. Okay, and I rattled off most of them earlier. So they've held unconstitutional laws that regulate the wealthy and corporations in their use of money in the political process. They have held unconstitutional laws that regulate guns. They've held unconstitutional laws that regulate commercial advertising by corporations and businesses. They've held unconstitutional laws that regulate property, property rights of individual and corporate owners. They've held unconstitutional laws that constitute affirmative action. Right? On the other hand, they have upheld laws that limit the rights of persons accused of crime. They have upheld laws that limit access to the right to vote. They have upheld laws that discriminate against gays and lesbians. They have voted to uphold laws that discriminate against women. So basically, if you lay this out and say, okay, why is one group of case in one category and the other type of case in the other category, the only answer you can really come up with is these are their personal political policy preferences. They like guns. They like commercial advertising. They like business. They like the wealthy. They like corporations. They don't like gays. They don't like, I don't want to say they don't like women, but they don't like <laughs> the rights of women. They certainly don't like people accused of crime. But there's no principled argument you can make to explain how these cases get sorted into these two categories. Now, they don't know this particularly. They're deciding each case as it comes up to them, and they decide it in what they believe to be a principled, honest way. It's only when you sort of lay them out and say what's really going on that you can see what the pattern is in fact. Um, and this is highly problematic. It's highly problematic, first of all, because I would argue it's an illegitimate use of judicial authority and one that we should be very concerned about. And second, it, it's a concern um, because it has an enormous impact on American society. If one thinks simply about Citizens United or gun control decisions, um, those have profound effects on our society. Now, let me say a word about um, the election. Actually, several of you pointed out to me this morning, there's a piece in today's Tribune on this very subject in which I'm actually quoted, so it's, it's a nice timing. And of course, <laughs> Monday is the, tomorrow is the first day of the court's new term, so this issue is also, for that reason, um, relevant. So right now, we have a Supreme Court that's divided in the following way. There are four moderate liberal justices. That is, Justices Breyer, Kagan, Sotomayor, and Ginsburg. I say they're moderate liberal because if you compare them to justices from the prior generation, Brennan, Marshall, Douglas, Warren, Fortas, Goldberg, they are much more conservative, much more cautious than the Warren court liberals. They're liberal, but they're moderately, cautiously liberal. There are four justices who are extremely conservative. Roberts, Alito, Scalia, and Thomas. Indeed, two, two of my conservative colleagues at the University of Chicago did a, an empirical effort to analyze the liberal or conservative views of justices over the last 75 years by looking at voting patterns and so on. And what they determined is that the four most conservative justices that serve on the court in the last 75 years are Roberts, Alito, Thomas, and Scalia. And the fifth most conservative was Rehnquist, and the sixth most conservative was Kennedy. And Kennedy is the swing vote, right? And Kennedy is, in fact, quote, the swing vote, because although he's quite conservative, he's not as conservative as the, as the, as the other four, so he's the one who basically decides. And it turns out, this is some, some analysis I recently did, Kennedy, on, on important cases, Kennedy votes with the very conservative justices two-thirds of the time and with the moderate liberals one-third of the time, which means the court is predominantly quite conservative, and when it's conservative, it's often very conservative. 
Um, okay, so it's divided though. So what happens now is the outcome of the 2012 presidential election? Well, first of all, nothing may happen. It's possible that four years will pass and no justice will leave the court, in which case there are no, no consequences. But it's also possible, since many of them are in their 70s and 80s, that um, one or more of them may die or resign, retire. And the two most likely, just age-wise, are Ginsburg on the left and Scalia on the far right. So we can ask ourselves what would happen if one of those two justices were to leave, or either were to leave, and they were replaced by uh, the, either Romney or Obama. So if, if Ginsburg were to die and Obama is president, nothing would change. He would appoint someone else more or less like Ginsburg. The world wouldn't change. Similarly, if Scalia were to leave the court and Romney would replace Scalia, nothing much would change. He would appoint someone more or less on the conservative side. So the interesting question is what happens if Ginsburg were to leave the court and Romney is president, or if Scalia were to leave the court and Obama was president? Presumably... Obama would appoint someone like, say, Kagan, his last appointment, a moderate liberal, and Romney would appoint someone like the last conservative appointment, Samuel Alito, Alito who would basically change the course dramatically. So what happens then is you've got a significant shift. You then have, if Obama's elected and Scalia leaves the court and Obama gets to replace Scalia, you'd have five moderate liberals on profound change in the direction of the Supreme Court. If Ginsburg were to leave the court and Romney were elected and he were to appoint someone like Alito, then the swing vote would become Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> and Kennedy would no longer even be the swing vote. The court would move even further to the right. Um, so the stakes in the election, if one of the, the Justices should die are potentially very great, enormously great, in fact, for a whole range of potential issues. Um, this coming year, for instance, the court has before it um, a number of very important questions. Uh, one, which will be argued in, in two weeks, involves affirmative action. Uh, the Supreme Court upheld affirmative action uh, nine years ago. Uh, saying that it can be used if it's only one among many factors, if race is only one among many factors. Um, it was a 5-4 decision. The fifth vote in the majority was Justice O'Connor. Justice O'Connor was replaced by Samuel Alito. There's no question what Alito's view on affirmative action would be. And so there are clearly five justices on the current Supreme Court who would hold affirmative action on constitutional period. Whether they will override the precedent is another question. But this group of justices has done that several times already. Citizens United overruled a six-year-old precedent, which was exactly the same situation. It was a 5-4 decision six years earlier with O'Connor in the majority. A leader replaced O'Connor. They overruled the prior decision in Citizens United. In another case involving uh, abortion, the exact same thing happened. Uh, with respect to um, late-term abortion, the court in the 5-4 decision held unconstitutional, a law prohibiting late-term abortion. O'Connor was the fifth vote. She leaves, she's replaced by Alito, and the court five years later reaches the opposite result. Um, so it's perfectly possible that the court will hold affirmative action per se unconstitutional. Um, there's also the Voting Rights Act case that's pending. Voting Rights was enacted in 1965 um, to ensure that southern states, which had obviously been involved for many generations, in discrimination against African Americans in voting um, could not continue to do so uh, in subtle ways. And so the Voting Rights Act required states, southern states that had a long history of discrimination against African Americans in voting to get approval by the Department of Justice of any changes they made to their voting practices before they went into effect. And the Supreme Court has repeatedly upheld the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act the Supreme Court is likely to hear that case again this time, the argument being it's, it's time to let it go. Even if it was constitutional in the past, it's, it's almost 60 years old, and we no longer should have the, the Voting Rights Act, and there's a very good possibility that the five justices in the majority would invalidate that 
legislation today. And of course, the issue of same-sex marriage is one that uh, is likely to get to the court this year, um, either in the form of the Defense of Marriage Act or in the, 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 the issue of, of same-sex marriage itself out of California. Um, so the stakes are very high. They continue to be high, both in terms of, of, of um, social issues and uh, individual rights issues. And the differences between these two types of justices are dramatic. Okay, let me stop at that point and uh, turn it over back to Svetlana. Thank you.